Now, it may be quite easy to see from my car ownership history and most of the content that you see on my channel that I am a BMW guy, but why am I a BMW guy? I'm too busy out here replacing coolant reservoirs and not using my turn signal to realize that for a while, Mercedes was putting a hand-built 6.2 liter, 500 horsepower V8 in their answer to the V10 M5 of the day, the E63 AMG. This is the W212 chassis car. It is from the year 2011, so it is the last model year to have this naturally aspirated monster of a V8 underneath the hood. And it's the closest you can get to Germany's answer to the American muscle car. But in typical German fashion, they overdid it. It's nice and luxurious on the inside and quiet for the daily business commute. But when you want it to, it turns into an absolute ravenous monster. 518 horsepower underneath the hood here, which we will take a look at in a little bit. This generation, which started in 2010, ended in 2016, began with this 6.2 liter V8, and then after this moved to a slightly more powerful, but more economical, more environmentally friendly twin turbo 5.5 liter V8. But again, this is the last year you could get a naturally aspirated 6.2 liter monster under the hood. And a car like this is never going to be made again. Even the current AMG with a four liter twin turbo V8 is soon to graduate into a twin turbo six cylinder with a hybrid component, I'm sure. Tons of power, yes, but the V8 is gonna die off. And soon enough, the whole internal combustion engine, AMG Mercedes, is gonna die too. So this car is definitely going to go down as a classic in the coming years with electric cars coming about. Looking at it right now, it's, it's just amazing to see that this actually happened, that Mercedes said, we, shall, we will put a 6.2 liter V8 with no turbochargers in our motor here, and it's going to get a million on the Autobahn. A little bit too many wiener schnitzels taken that day. <sighs> That's terrible. Do I keep it in the video? Why not? You get the idea. It's pretty crazy. And then they did that with the C-Class and the C63 AMG, which is, so as is typical of my car reviews, next we need to talk about what I find to be quite an important feature of a car that is important to get right, not get wrong, is the styling. First of all, it gets points for being a lot more understated and sleeper-like than the modern AMG is, and even the one that came right after this. In 2013, there was a facelift on the E63, which gave it a, a big aggressive front grille, and it looks angry and mean, and sure, that's cool. But for people who don't know cars, or for guys who drive around in their V6 Dodge Challengers thinking that they own the road, they see this, roll up beside them at a traffic light and they think, ah, that's just some diesel, crappy, slow Mercedes sedan. The guy's on his way to his business job. He's probably gonna get fired because he's a total loser. And then they just get completely dusted at the lights. And that is what makes these older Mercedes AMG models so appealing. You wouldn't know unless you know or you look at the badges on the side that says 6.3 AMG. It's not actually technically a 6.3, but it says 6.3 on the side. It says E63 AMG on the back. And it does look a little bit more aggressive up front than a standard E-Class, but not really enough for somebody who doesn't know much about these things to be able to notice. And that is the best thing about an AMG from this time period. When we get to the actual E-Class part of the styling, mainly the side, the headlights, most of the back end, the roof. I do like a car to me more angular than swoopy. It's easily a much better looking car than the E-Class of the late 90s and early 2000s, you know, the taxi one. What I don't like about the styling of this E-Class 
is this back door here. You see, it's just this door handle is a little bit set too far into the car away from the edge of the door and that always bothers me a little bit more than you think it should. It still functions as a door handle perfectly fine. But otherwise, this car is still very classic Mercedes. It's got that three-pointed star hood emblem which will fold back if you try to run somebody down with it. See some guy at the cars and coffee meet with the V10 M5 is talking trash about how his car can hit 9,000 RPM. He's not mentioning the rod bearings, of course. And he keeps talking and talking and going on about how his BMW is better than your Mercedes. You need to run him down. And that three-pointed star is really going to hurt him and teach him a lesson. No, it actually folds back for pedestrian protection. So you're welcome for the consumer advice that I am providing on my channel. Still very classic Mercedes-ish styling. You've got the separated headlights up front, which is a pretty distinctive Mercedes look, especially on the E-Class. They had that for years. I do like the classic and modern tie-in with the angular modern styling yet classic Mercedes front end look. So overall, I do really like how this car looks. And we come now to the reason that this particular E-Class is so special. 6.2 liter hand-built AMG engine Definitely not notorious for exploding when its head studs go, but this is a later built model, so it doesn't suffer from that issue. This is the M156 V8, and again, it is world famous because of just how bonkers and crazy it is. 6.2 liter V8, which is normally what you would expect to find in something like a Dodge Challenger or a Corvette, not something from the other side of the pond in Europe but this is what we have here. 518 horsepower, and it's something like 465 pound-feet of torque to the rear wheels only via a seven-speed automatic transmission. We can be assured that this is built well because it is built by the one and only Kai Bil Bilney, something like that. Yeah, it's built by that person. If this engine fails, you can look them up on social media, find where they live, go to their house, and So I am very excited to take this out on the road and drive it with traction control on because it's raining. I don't want to crash somebody else's car. All right, let's get back behind here between these huge quad AMG exhaust tips to see what kind of practicality we have offered to us. Now again, this is a mid-size sedan, so yes, it's important that it does 150, 200 miles an hour on the Autobahn or whatever, but it also needs to be able to carry all your briefcases and um, drugs if you're into that sort of thing. So let's see what we have back here. We already know what to expect. It is a large trunk area, nice and wide with a nice big opening so you can throw stuff in pull it out really easily. Got a couple storage nets on the side. There's a Mercedes-Benz first aid kit in here, which is cool. Cigarette style charging outlet, which is also a nice thing to have back here whenever you need it. Rear seats fold down with these unmarked levers here. I'm sure that's what they do. And who knows, maybe it's a self-destruct button. Ugh. Under the floor here, there's a spare tire. And yeah, nothing particularly interesting about that underneath. The E63 AMG was available as a station wagon the year after this in North America in 2012, and that was the one that came with the twin turbo V8. That's the one that Doug DeMira owned. 2010 and 2011 models, the best you could get was a stand, but it's a large enough cargo area back here anyways. So yeah, cool cargo area. And again, look at this a power trunk and how 2007 is that folks here we go rear seat room of the w212 e63 amg now i am six foot three and well i have about a millimeter of knee room my feet don't have a lot of room down there which is a little annoying so it's not the greatest and i think that is partly to blame on the fact that this seat is so huge, it's almost as wide as like a lazy boy recliner. <laughs> and that's, it has various components in it and side bolsters that can move and 
just there's a lot that goes into the seat rather than just leather. So when, once you take that into account, it is understandable why the seat is so huge, but it is a little bit annoying, especially when you're the guy that gets stuck back here. In terms of headroom and shoulder room, that's where this really shines in comparison. I am a tall man, as I have just said, and I barely have enough headroom. Anyone taller than six foot four might have issues back here, but I do have plenty of shoulder room no problem at all. So my upper half is very comfortable. My lower half isn't so comfortable, but overall it's good. If you want larger rear seat room, you'd get an S63 AMG, but it's definitely okay enough for average size people. Let's check this center storage area here. There's a little storage net on the lid for the rear seat pass-through, which is uh, interesting. A little bit of extra storage up here, which is sweet. And Ah, yes. Nothing like over-designed German cup holders. It's one of those great automotive pleasures. It is a multiple step process to get this to open. The lid slides up as the cup holder expands within it, and then it goes around. This hinge moves down a little bit to stabilize it, and then it settles into its resting place. Cup holders are ready for you to put your um, unnamed German beer I don't really know, but this is a nice little area here. And I guess, now that I think of it, this can close up. So you still have a nice place to rest your arm and cup holders here. So I mock them for making something so over-engineered, but it, it does make sense why it's like this. And it's smart. So well done, Mercedes-Benz. Large transmission tunnel here. Again, I reviewed the new 5 Series a little while back, and it's more understandable in a shorter car like this. There's not a lot of room to engineer a transmission tunnel without cutting into the interior somewhat. They are Germans, but they don't have magical powers. So that's going to be there. Getting in and out because of this seat here and this bulging part is a little bit of a challenge, but that's okay. Now this is where the E63 AMG needs to shine. You don't buy this car to sit in the back seat, do you? You buy this car to drive it. There's plenty of adjustment in the seat, which is up here on the door. It's a bit of a weird place to put it, but if you know Mercedes, that won't be a big deal for you because they always have it there. And there's even more seat controls down here next to the seat belt. All the controls for your thigh support, the bolsters here, which can tighten up in hard corners, stuff like that. Again, materials are really nice. This steering wheel right here is wrapped in gorgeous, lovely feeling leather. And everywhere we are gonna be grabbing it on the racetrack or just on the road, it's nice perforated leather. So you get a little bit more grip. I think that's what that's for. Even the middle, the middle looks like cheap plastic, but it feels quite nice. Gorgeous wood and aluminum. And there's plastics, but nothing up here feels cheap. A lot of it looks cheap and then you touch it and you're like, no, that's actually quite nice. <laughs> Lots of stocks coming off the steering wheel here on the left. Lots meaning two. And one of them is the turn signal and the wiper. And this other one is just for the cruise control. So moving from the steering wheel to the gauge cluster, we have a huge central speedometer with a screen on the middle. Sets the trend for 10 years later, these days where most cars have fully digital gauge clusters. The speedometer has this magic floating needle that comes out off of the screen, rotates around the screen all the way up to 200 miles per hour. And on the inside, it shows you various things like trip, information, yada, 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 some cool stuff. This speedometer is flanked by four more gauges. To the left, there is a huge clock, which is, if you don't know Mercedes, then that's that might be a little bit weird for you, but they've been doing that for ever. Then there is a tiny fuel gauge, not that interesting, but you'll be looking at that a lot since it's a 6.2 liter V8. On the right hand side, a tachometer, which is the same size as the clock, but it does say 6.3 V8 in that tachometer. Classic dated infotainment display, which doesn't appear to want to come on. Do not let command distract you from the traffic situation. Achtung! It's not, it doesn't have a touchscreen component. It's just controlled with this wheel down here. It is quite dated by modern standards, very dated. And now it's telling me it's shutting off. Okay, so it doesn't like me. Um, and that's fine because I don't really like it either. By modern standards, it is not good. 
But if you're buying a 6.2 liter V8 AMG and you're complaining about the command system up here, then you have something wrong in your life and you need to, you need to go see a therapist or something. This, there's a lot of buttons up here. So there's a phone pad here so you can call for important business stuff, I suppose. You're a bagel salesman and you need to, you've got a great idea about some new bagel flavor, pumpernickel, and you gotta call your sales assi assistant guy. You gotta tell him, I have had the most amazing idea, and then pumpernickel comes out. It's a massive success. You can order an S63 AMG. Parking sensors and a rear-facing camera, which is nice, but I'm told that the rear-facing camera only works when the radio's on. Some electrical issues then, but we won't, we will forgive it for that. In the center here, you have your typical AMG knobs and drive controls that are angled towards the driver. Got comfort, sport, sport plus, manual mode, traction control off. I won't be pressing that button in the rain today. Suspension tuning and AMG, which is a configurable drive mode, which is quite high tech and ahead of its time. One interesting thing that there is, is a foot mounted parking brake, which you wouldn't expect to see on a 500 horsepower super sedan, but that is what you have here. Irresponsibly revved up a, where are my wipers? They're on the left on the turn signal stock where I wouldn't expect them to be. Oh. And there we go. The turn signal and the wiper stock are the same. And where you would normally expect to have the turn signal, there is a cruise control stock, which I find to be annoying. And it'll take me a bit of time to get used to that. We're gonna switch it to comfort mode because that's where most people are gonna be driving a vehicle like this. There is some noise getting into the cabin. This is an absolutely garbage road here. This thing needs to be a performance car as well as luxury car. So there is a little bit of compromise. It does have some harshness for sure. In comfort mode, it is beautifully quiet. Dips and bumps and things. There we go, I just hit the cruise control stock again. That's pretty good. That is quite good. It is exactly what I expected, exactly what I wanted. It is insane, it's loud, it sounds muscly, it sounds like I just put my foot down in a Corvette or something, but the difference is I'm surrounded by wood and aluminum and leather. Now these are a lot cheaper now than they used to be. Um, but don't expect them to stay cheap forever because I do genuinely think that this thing is a modern classic. I mean, it's, it's got to be. It has all the makings of it. There's traction control light flashing at me. <laughs> On a day like this, it has a little bit more power than it knows what to do with. Even in Sport Plus mode, when, it, when you settle off the throttle, it's still quiet. It's not drony at all. You forget that you're in such a powerful sedan. Really the right combination of comfort-ish. It's no Rolls Royce or anything, but it's easily good enough to drive every day. You can complain about this, this command infotainment system. I don't think it works well in this car as well as it's supposed to, but it's it shouldn't put you off when you have this to play with. Good Lord. That felt like actual wheel spin and the traction control didn't bother. It's like, yeah, you can handle it. It's fun though. I mean, it's exactly what you expect. It's exactly what you want from an AMG car. Again, this is never gonna happen again. After this, they went to turbocharging. Yes, those cars make more powerful. Yes, they're faster. Yes. Modern turbocharged engines are really good at disguising the fact that they're turbocharged. The responsiveness and feel and sound of a big naturally aspirated V8 is never gonna be replicated that well and 
lots of automakers only have what 10 years to do it and they're all focusing on getting ahead in the electric game which makes sense but it's sad i mean this is the end of an era but man does it haul whoa okay all right i'm gonna let i'm gonna let, i'm gonna let off mercedes amg doing what a mercedes amg is supposed to do and it's what it wants to do which is light the rear tires up the back end started to step out there traction control was trying to handle it but it wasn't really doing a good enough job i feel like it's just oh my gosh and the shifts are so smooth too it just goes through the gears no problem you barely notice it but you do notice the difference in sound coming from that v8 Every gear shift is just so satisfying just because of the noise that it makes. Again, it's that AMG, that hand-built V8 bellow that this car is so well known for. I, I struggle to think of anything wrong with this car. I suspect if you own one, then you will see something wrong with your frequent uh, trips to the gas stations. Um, because that will happen a lot, especially if you drive like an absolute moron. The only drawbacks this car has are defeated by that immediately, instantly. It's just doesn't matter anymore. Uh, I want to thank Tamor for lending me his car. I, I greatly appreciate it. Thanks everybody for watching, and I hope everybody has a marvelous day. Thank you.